Welcome back everyone. You came here for airplanes, but today we're going to talk about the government. That's right, everyone's favorite topic. We're going to discuss a small part of the Federal Aviation Regulations, or FARS, and give a perspective on why they impact the cost of airplane ownership. You want cheap, safe, useful airplanes, and understanding the rules is the only way to get there. You see, the United States government has handed us the FARS, or more accurately, Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, or 14 CFR, to hold your hand as you learn to fly, continue to fly, and even plan to repair your own hard-earned property. Don't you just love freedom? Anyways, let's talk about 14 CFR Chapter 1, Subchapter C, Part 43, Section 43.3. Are you lost yet? Good, because every general aviation online forum post from a guy who only plays Microsoft Flight Simulator like me will prove to you that you are not alone. These things were written by lawyers and you can tell. By the way, you can abbreviate all of this by saying 14 CFR part 43.3 and your flying neighbors will love you for it. It describes who can do what to maintain, build, and alter airplanes. The two things we're concerned about here are preventative maintenance and doing other work on airplanes under supervision. It goes a little like this. Paragraph G. Except for holders of sport pilot certificate, the holder of a pilot certificate issued under Part 61 may perform preventative maintenance on any aircraft owned or operated by that pilot, which is not used under Part 121, 129, or 135 of this chapter. The holder of a sport pilot certificate may perform preventative maintenance on an aircraft owned or operated by that pilot and issued a special airworthiness certificate in the light sport category. Here's the translation. If you operate your own airplane for grassroots aviation, that is not for hire or commercial purposes, there's a list of stuff you can do to prevent hardships like being stranded at a remote airport because of a aging bad spark plug all by yourself. Yeah, you can feel it pretty good. Like, yeah. You know, as soon as it sort of starts to tighten up. Exactly. But these look perfect. That's what I end up doing is just kind of shimmying it while I squeeze. And then once it starts getting resistance, like right there, maybe another eighth of a turn or a quarter turn, it's pretty tight. And then usually it you know, looks pretty good. Check Go to paragraph D. A person working under the supervision of a holder of a mechanic or repairman certificate may perform the maintenance, preventative maintenance, and alteration that his supervisor is authorized to perform. If the supervisor personally observes the work being done to the extent necessary to ensure that it is being done properly, and if the supervisor is readily available in person for consultation. However, this paragraph does not authorize the performance of any inspection required by Part 91 or Part 125 of this chapter or any inspection performed after a major repair or alteration. Here's the translation. It's not the only case covered by this paragraph, but you can do all the work on your grassroots type airplane as long as you are being supervised by someone who is licensed to perform that work that you are doing. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion about a new interpretation of this and similar regulations that seem to imply that if this is the case, your AMP must be hovering over your shoulder to yell stop the moment you accidentally use a 10 millimeter socket on a 3 8 nut. If this was the case, you'd spend a lot of money paying maintenance professionals a fair wage to stand there and look at you while you do just about anything. The various alphabet organizations are fiercely battling this interpretation, and you should too, because there's no reason why we need to make airplane maintenance more difficult and expensive to perform when AMPs are already underpaid and sometimes unavailable to do the work to keep a 60-year-old airplane flying. Am I following this topic closely? You bet I am, because as I talk about this, my fingernails are still dirty from the work I just did on a project airplane I haven't even told you about onto the supervision and work plan of not one, but two of my favorite maintenance professionals and their pets. At the end of the day, what really separates these various regulations is who puts their signature on the paper to return the airplane to service. Is it preventative maintenance? 
then yeah, you make your own logbook entry and you carry on. Was it more than that? Well, the chances are you'll need an AMP or above, including inspection authorized AMPs or sometimes designated engineering representatives to return the airplane on paper to airworthy status. Let's come back around to paragraph G, you doing preventative maintenance. The FAA actually made it easy by publishing a document called Maintenance Aspects of Owning Your Own Aircraft that clarifies for the most part what they think is preventative maintenance. But because you came here for information, here's at least a portion of that list. Remove, install, and repair landing gear tires. Service landing gear wheel bearings. Service landing gear shock struts. Replace defective safety wire or cotter keys. Lubricate items not requiring disassembly other than the removal of non-structural items. Replenish hydraulic fluid in the hydraulic reservoir. Apply preservative protective material to components where no disassembly of a primary structure or operating system is involved and where such coating is not prohibited or contrary to good practices. Replace safety belts. Replace bulbs, reflectors, and lenses of position and landing lights. Replace or clean spark plugs and set spark plug gap clearance. Replace any hose connection except hydraulic connections. Replace and service batteries. Make simple fabric patches not requiring rib stitching or removal of structural parts or control surfaces. Replace any cowling not requiring removal of the propeller or disconnection of flight controls. This week, I replaced the nose tire on an airplane and because I've done so before, it only took me two hours to get it right. Why so long? Because I had to jack the airplane safely, gather the tools, remove the wheel assembly, deflate the tube, break the tire beads, separate the wheel halves, remove the tube, install the new tube, reassemble the wheel halves, inflate the tire, inspect the wheel bearings, and reverse the removal. My AMP brethren and sistrin could probably do this much faster, but for me, it was totally worth it. I also likely saved upwards of $100 doing it all by myself. Things aren't getting cheaper, folks. And had that airplane not also been going through an annual, I would sign this off in my own logbook and return the airplane to service. Doing this work ahead of an annual will also make that future annual inspection smoother. When an annual on a 50-year-old retractable gear Piper Cherokee costs upwards of $4,000, you'll get smart and learn how to safely jump into action. Multiply what I just did by the long list of stuff we talked about on previous videos about annuals and you'll see how this stuff adds up quickly. Preventative maintenance is a clear winner, so do what you can. It might be worth having your maintenance professional walk you through difficult tasks like replacing a bulb. Well, I'm just kidding, of course, but if you're doing something for the first time, have them handy. They can walk you through it and you'll feel confident the second time. But Jawanza, what about getting deeper into maintenance? Well, this one's all about relationships. For now, I can tell you that if you don't know your AMP's birthday, then you're doing it all wrong. When there's work to be done, coming up with a list of to-dos under supervision is essential. I would hate to see you spend $1,000 just to have someone uncowl your airplane and replace the battery or remove the floorboards for inspection. You have the tools, you potentially have the skills, so find out what your maintenance professional wants you to do to help them out and help your wallet out at the same time. Make a plan for getting them involved if you get stuck with a rounded nut or a stuck bolt and then call them over to your workstation or get on the phone. That's if the new interpretation of the supervised maintenance doesn't completely ruin this for us. At the end of the day, we're being priced out of general aviation. That much is true. We're flying much safer, but losing the fleet quickly to neglect and delayed maintenance. But who can blame us when a spark plug costs $100 and an automotive spark plug costs 12? We do what we can, when we can, and get dirty when it means addressing things on time and in the right way. What do you think? Oh. I'm happy to respond to your comments down below and thanks for watching.